welcome to Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And today I'm super excited because I have a good friend of mine who I absolutely adore. You have seen her on Too Close for Comfort and Curb Your Enthusiasm. She will talk about her road to recovery today. And she has a million amazing stories, and I love them all. Please welcome the amazing Lydia Cornell. Hi, Hi Lydia. Hi, beautiful Grace. I'm with you. You're such a sweetheart. Oh, share this. Wait a second. Let me share it. Sharing it. Okay. Technology is not my forte. <laughs> Okay, good. For those out there, she needs to share <laughs> the live broadcast on her page. So she's doing that right now. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. There's a lot of people tuning in. Thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, we are going to have a, a great talk with Lydia about her recovery. Um, so I'll just leave it up to you to start telling us your story uh, mm -hmm. of how it all started. So you want to talk, we were talking about my recovery. How yes, about your recovery, yes. Oddly enough, it started, of course, in childhood. I, I'm realizing now through a lot of, I haven't had a lot of psychotherapy, but I had a spiritual, I call it a catastrophic spiritual awakening oh. in 1994, 25 years ago, on September 11th, 1994. And it started in childhood. And I, I think it's so important for parents to tell their kids they're valuable and loved. Mm -hmm. Because I, you and I have the same kind of parent. I had a parent that was incredibly abusive to me. Mm -hmm. Unbeknownst to her, she we didn't know she was bipolar until three years ago. Right. My mother, and I love my mother. And I have to tell you, I have to jump to the future right now, to the present, because in February, I went to see her in the nursing home. We're taking care of them in a boarding care. And I sat down with her, and after all the things we've been through in life, and you'll hear, you'll, you'll hear a little bit of that, um, I held her in my arms, and I looked her in the eyes, and I said, I love you so much, mom. You were the best mother that ever, that could possibly be. You were the best mother in the world. That's all she ever wanted to hear from me. And I never could completely forgive her. Wow. And she just wept in my arms. It was like complete forgiveness. And I feel that that's the full circle I came to through sobriety and recovery. But wow. recovery isn't about quitting drinking. It's about filling the hole in your heart, right. the hole in your soul. Yeah, especially when you have a mentally ill mother, you know, yeah. that doesn't know and is not medicated. And then they abuse you and you're like, you don't understand. Do they love me? Do they hate me? So you're basically looking for love. That's what you're doing. You have to fill that emptiness. So you try to look for love through. All the wrong place. I came to Hollywood seeking the adoration of strangers, thinking of fame would fill me up. A lot, of, a lot of people love me. Maybe I'll feel love. No way. No. Hollow fame is very hollow. It's very mm -hmm. shallow unless you, you find it for the creative purpose of actually doing your art and loving the art. I mean, I love comedy. I love writing. I love playing with other actors, playing with you, doing comedy with people and creating. But it took me a while to get to back to my art. Yeah. But to make a long story short, when I was a little girl, my mom, I was born in El Paso, Texas, to a mother who said you have to look perfect at all times. I had long sausage curl ringlets and she would spend hours in my hair every day and i was like mom i'm basically a creative tomboy at heart and i, I tend to be girly to fit in you know and she was if, if one hair was out of place she would scream at me in rage oh and i remember feeling wow. constantly under pressure to be perfect yeah and um my dad was born in russia raised in shanghai he was a shanghai violinist mm -hmm. who was trapped in during World War II, he was trapped by the Japanese when they invaded China, and he had to stay there. He was admitted to the um, Curtis Institute of Music, and his dreams were crushed. He couldn't leave China. Oh, wow. Luckily, I wouldn't have been born if he came any earlier, but he came to America, met my mother at the Hollywood Bowl. He was playing violin. He was extremely aristocratic and beautiful and very artistic, and yeah. when he came to El Paso, he became a Russian cowboy. Oh, wow. So, Ten gallon hat and he owned a roofing business. That's funny. Yeah. So he was he was very silent and mysterious and exotic. Mm -hmm. My mother was perfect, you know, like a beautiful woman. And um, in high school, we moved to New York, which was really a culture shock. I'd never seen trees before. Oh, no. Yeah. Like I'd seen trees. El Paso's all desert. Yeah. 
but we hung out in Albuquerque and we met, you know, Las Cruces, New Mexico for vacations. And then we moved to Scarsdale and I was like, I want to be Jewish. I want to be a Jewish male comic. It was an all Jewish community of extremely wealthy people. And we didn't fit in. I was the outcast, a total nerd. Um, my father was a violinist. He got this amazing job offer to start in the shipping industry. But I remember not fitting in, being the only person that wasn't Jewish in my whole group of kids. And I'm standing in front of the mirror, getting ready to go to my first date on, you know, to junior prom, 16 years old. And I'm standing there combing my hair to hide my acne. I had really bad skin. Wow. Yeah. And I was trying to cover, my hair was the only thing I had. My hair was my security blanket. Your crown, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so totally. hair, my hair covered up all the flaws of the acne. I had to like, mm -hmm. so I had my one date coming up, junior prom, 16 years old. My parents wouldn't allow me to date. They were very strict. And I'm in front of mom's lot full in the mirror, combing my hair over my zits. And it was down to my waist. And my mom walks by and she had this look on her face. Like she said, you think you're pretty with that long hippie hair. And she grabbed me by the hair. She pulled out the largest pair of sewing scissors we owned. They're garden shears. They were like this big. Oh my God. And in my mind, I'm like, I, I went, I think I blacked out and she proceeded to cut it off above my hairline. Oh my God. It was, it wasn't even attractive for a pixie cut. It was like the ugliest hair. Oh my God. <laughs> we're exposed. I couldn't go to the prom. Um, my dad was in Japan on a business trip and he brought home a human hair wig. It was all Japanese hair, long black hair. And I had to wear that. I wore that to school. Oh my God. And I had one gay friend in high school named Monroe, Monroe Mendelssohn. And he tried to help me. He put on a scarf, a babushka. And we went to the senior prom a year later. My hair grew back a little, but it was like, I remember this happening and I remember screaming. And then I remember my mother falling down to my knees, begging forgiveness. Like she didn't mean to do it. Uh -huh. and it a very weird Betty Davis, Joan Crawford moment, you know? Wow. So um, that was like some childhood stuff. Yeah, definitely. And, and growing up with a mentally ill mother, it's uh, anything triggers them and you never know what it is. And their reactions are so like, oh yeah, insane. you're like, what just happened? It's like she like, cut her hair. What, what triggered I her? If I said something to her, I smiled at her once. And she would get that grin off your face. What is that? You know, and I was going, I'm, I'm loving you right now. I'm giving you a loving wow. nothing. You never knew. You know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's unpredictable all the way. And it's nerve wracking. It's debilitating. Yeah. yeah it's, oh, it's absolutely. Yeah. And you're I, always I, waiting I, for that explosion, right? You're always like, when, when are they going to explode? What am I going to do wrong? And yeah. you, that's why you want it to be perfect. If because a child it, doesn't feel love, they don't grow up with low self-esteem. And I really believe, that I wrote this joke once, that low self-esteem should be classified as a disability. Because it's like, it's yeah. like you need to get tax benefit. Yeah. So many people go shoot up schools and, and, and go into rages because they have such lack of love. That right. It provokes and promotes envy. Mm -hmm. you know, if you yeah. love yourself, you're not about to be mad at anyone. You're kind of happy for other people when they're successful. You know? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and it's that, so you, you had that desire to be perfect, that um, feeling of not being loved, which is the worst thing. So you come to LA, right? Well, and no, but first before that, I went to college, that, okay. Boulder, Colorado, I went to college, and it was, I couldn't wait to get away from home, I, you know, stay all my time in Colorado, skiing, working at the rock, rock and Roll Studio with the Beach Boys and everyone. And I remember the first semester break, first of all, I went to college and I said, Mom, Whatever you do, don't give away my Barbies. I had the original Barbie, Ken and Midge. Not the original, but like a very valuable, today, a very valuable vintage Barbie. And she had the red bubble cut hair do, you know? And the yeah. Ken doll with the arm missing. The Ken doll had real limbs that you could pull. Yeah. <laughs> and it had hair made of fuzz. And I remember I had this whole Barbie doll dream house. And I packed it away into the corner of our vast attic in the Victorian house we lived in. And sure enough, I come home my first Christmas break and they're gone. She goes, I gave those away. You didn't need those things. So now that I have a kid, a boy who did, didn't, I never give away anything of his, you know? Yeah. Like I'm a little bit paranoid about it. Mm -hmm. I have all the Thomas tank engines in the garage, everything. But um, 
So I carried a resentment for 20 years against my mother for giving me my Barbies. Yeah. Right? Of course. So in 1994, I remember I had a baby out of wedlock. I was a single mom. I had a brand new baby, six months old, and I I was Oh gosh, this was a really, really, whenever I tell the story in a recovery meeting, it starts like this. I was standing at the top of the stairs, holding my brand new baby in my arms, mm -hmm. going into a complete blackout. Mm -hmm. I was a radioactive drunk and I'd been drinking all night long freight straight stoli out of a bottle. Wow. And there was a long lead up up to that point of that happening. I hadn't been drinking during the pregnancy, but as soon as he was born, and it's tough to talk about this stuff in a way, but Mm -hmm. The robot was ringing down below, and I went into a complete blackout, and I don't remember how I got down the stairs. Wow. But I got down safely with my baby, and I remember the fuzziness of my mother opening the door with my Uncle Sonny, and she was going to show off the new baby and come over, and I wasn't, I was supposed to be dressed in white gloves, wow. and it was noon, and I was in my nightgown, and it was like a Tennessee Williams play, a streetcar named Desire. And... Um, the horror in her eyes and they took the baby away from me for a few days and I went to bed, I sobered up. And leading up to this weekend, I've been driving around to Labor Day barbecues with the baby. And there's a lot of this other stuff I'll tell another, another, another meeting one day. But it was so weird because a few days later, I went to dinner at my sister's house and they invited me for, for dinner a week later. I still had the baby with me. I had a nanny living in. My mom and sister came to stay for a while. And then one day my sister went home. She says, come on for dinner one night. So I walked down the road. She lived two blocks away in Beverly Hills. And I said, I walk in and there's a doctor from Brotman Hospital. My brother is there. My baby brother, Paul, my sister and my mother. And it was an intervention. And they right. said, what, you, what is this? They go, if you don't quit drinking, we're taking that baby away from you. And I went, I... He's, oh. the He's the pothead. I pointed at my brother. And they said, you're the one with the baby, though. And I promised the doctor I'd go to the hospital the next day to talk to the psychologist. So I go in the next day in a black short wig and red lipstick. Black. <laughs> I thought I was too famous to get sober. <laughs> that's hilarious. Little did I know everyone in town that's creative is sober or, you know, everyone yeah. the problem is doing this amazing program. So... I said, I don't want anyone to know who I am. I'm incognito. And he goes, Lydia, everyone in town is in this program. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so you're not alone. And, yeah. and anyway, wouldn't you rather be sober? We thought it was somebody who really did this. And I always thought sobriety was going to be really hard. Right. It's a miracle, actually. So what happened was I promised him, I said to him, what does it mean? Come 28 days to rehab. He goes, 28 days in rehab. But you can't see your baby. You can't have your baby live with you. And I went, no, no, I can't do that. So I went home that weekend. I made a decision on September 11th, 1994. I floated. I was drunk all weekend. I had one last bingy weekend, and I floated into the Good Shepherd Church in Beverly Hills. It's a women's meeting, and as I walk in this meeting with sunglasses and hat, I hear someone at the podium say, a woman at the podium, she says this. She's speaking, she's the speaker that day. She says, if you've wandered into this room and you don't know if you're an alcoholic, let's put it this way. Virgins don't take pregnancy tests. Right. The whole room roared of laughter and there was this smell of coffee and cinnamon pastries and bright, shiny women that looked happy and there was joy and laughter and right. women, I know from showbiz, very, very prominent people. And I thought, this doesn't look like a bunch of alcoholics. This is like, and I remember sitting there in my chair and they said, are there any newcomers present, any alcoholics? And my hand shot up on its own volition. It went by, oh, wow. Without my permission. And I'm like, <laughs> and at that moment, mm -hmm. tears poured down. I couldn't stop crying. I cried a river. A river of 20 years of hell lifted off me by the admission alone. Just the, That was my first surrender. My first wow, prayer. that's amazing. I love that. My first prayer. And then a miracle happened, which is the God shot, which is unbelievable right after that. What happened after that? A commercial break first. <laughs> a commercial break first. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm standing there and no one knows the story about my mom and the Barbies. Like 
I've already had a fight with her three times the week before over this. Mm -hmm. She, some really weird things happened around me accusing her. I couldn't let go. Mm -hmm. Barbie was in the news. Vintage Barbie was skyrocketing in value. They were doing a Barbie musical on Broadway. And I'm like, I, I kept kind of putting a knife in her about it. Every time I could bring it up. And it's like 20 years ago already. We yeah. were and so at the meeting that day, no one knows this about this story, but at the meeting that day, a woman, a wife of a big actor said to me, Lydia, are you, let's, let's go home. Let's go home to your house and have coffee. Yeah. Well, the fellowship afterward. And I went, okay. And I brought her home to my place at a townhouse in Beverly Hills and a little garden. And we sat outside and she said this to me out of the blue. She said, you're gonna overcome every resentment you ever had in this program. For example, I overcame a lifelong resentment against my mother for giving away my Barbies. And this hair on my neck. Wow. I, I just felt like I went, am I in the Twilight Zone? Am I Am I on a hidden camera show? Right. I know I really felt super, like a weird. Like a supernatural thing, yeah. Like that was a Coincidence was too uncanny to be just important. And it felt like my whole life was off track and then it was suddenly snapped into some sort of divine alignment. I and love it. And I never have had a craving to drink since that day. But I, I put in the, the actual, I went to meetings every day. I had hundreds of these coincidences that were so uncanny. It was like, there is something out there that loves us. It's like oh yeah, force of love that will pick you up at your lowest moment if you'll just surrender. You have to surrender and be vulnerable. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's key for everything. Give you up your old power. ideas and your, you know? and your old willpower. Mm -hmm. And realize I'm trying too hard to fit a square peg into a round hole. I'm going to walk away from the worry and the fear. And at that moment, just believing there was a power greater than me. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have to do that much at the point. At that point, I had to simply admit. Which is right. Step one. And then right. I came to believe in a power greater than myself. And you can call it a doorknob. You don't have to believe in a religion at all. Uh, absolutely. No, <laughs> you don't have to. But so try to stop the ocean waves if you don't believe there's a power greater than you. you exactly. Know? Whatever works. You know, different people believe in different things. Um, how did this affect your family? Like, how did your family react when you were, like, on the road to recovery? Well, I was so quickly off the bad. I, I was on a light beam. It felt like. I was so happy for the first five. I've been happy throughout sobriety. I've never, I've had a lot of, you know, other issues. I've had a cravings for chocolate and bad men and, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, we all do. <laughs> yeah. That's universal, uh, right? My parents were thrilled. My mother didn't quite ever get it. And I wish she had, but a lot of stages of our growth happened. I forgave her. Mm -hmm. that was another, it was level one of forgiveness. I had to go back and forgive again and again and again. Yeah. Because once you get, once you help yourself and you start to change people around you act differently, they change. Like, of course. Yeah. Um, is like, ah, it's, I'm detaching from that toxic person with love. I'm just going to not engage in the battle. I don't argue anymore. Although politically, I sometimes find myself biting my tongue, not to say, uh -huh. same here, <laughs> not to say anything. But yeah, that's, that's the thing. Releasing toxic people with love. I've been working on that myself. So how, how do you do that? Is there something that you do that helps you? I was going to show you how to engage with them. Okay. I don't think anyone can truly ever really solve their own problems. I'm, I'm, I'm positive that the yeah. higher thoughts are the thoughts of love, this universal force of love, which some, I call it God. Yeah. But it's so loving. And it's not at all like the archaic religions teach us. There's no fear in punishing God at all. God is love. Absolutely. Pure love. So when, no matter how far down you've fallen, no matter what you've done, you're always redeemable. You're always, yes. every day is a brand new start. So what I do is I, can, I, I shake off, like I had some really bad guilt. Guilt and regret are not from the source of love. No. Though it's things that make you feel terrible. You learn your lesson and you move forward. Destruction of, the destruction of so-called sin is by walking in the other direction, turning away from it. You don't punish yourself and chant a million different prayers over it. Um, religion is man-made and mm -hmm. God is the force of love inside all mankind, I believe, in all of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you have to do is 
stop worrying. It's really hard to do though. So if you, is. yeah, but worry comes from fear. So yes, worry yeah. comes from fear. and anger comes from fear. Fear I'm not getting what you want. The same coin, right? Exactly. Not getting what yeah. you want, and losing what you have. You know, fear. Well, fear. Fear is the worst. And the worst. Yeah, and it's so prevalent in humanity. We all have fear. So how do we deal with this fear with COVID? I mean, how are you dealing with it? Um. You know, I try not to be afraid because fear actually lowers your immunity. It's not good. So I think about it in those terms. So I'm like, okay, I'm protecting myself by not being afraid. Of course, you have to be cautious yeah. and intelligent about it. But uh, if you're afraid, I mean, you you can get and anything can happen in your life. You can get COVID. You can get hit by a bus, you know, whatever. Uh, so, yeah. So <laughs> I, think what we're, I don't think we're put on earth, I put here in this incarnation yeah. of what we are doing here, to be just a collection of body parts that need a pill for every body part and a, and a drug for every food and a constant worry about the, the making it and, and achieving more and more and more. We're not here for that. We're here for something no. else. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I shed my selfishness, I used to have this line. Um, I read somewhere, it was a philosopher, a quote by that great philosopher, Russell Brand, who said, <laughs> all my fuckers. Where are you getting your inspiration from, Lydia? <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. I I that great philosopher, Johnny Depp. Yeah. Um, all my suffering is, is a result of thinking about myself too much. Yes, exactly. I'm under fear. And, and then we start to resent other people. And right, because you compare it. yourself. It's all it's all ego based. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, what do you okay. think? Like, I I always think every time I I go into like fear and anger, I'm like, okay, what is my mission? What am I here for? Right. And my personal feeling is I'm here to love and help others. Okay. So, what is what is your mission? What do you feel you're here to do? I used to think it was to make people laugh. <laughs> Yes, well, that too. Yes, <laughs> I end up laughing all day, even when things are horrifying. I can find humor in it. I know, isn't that terrible? That we can do that? I know, what you mean. Yeah, like, I know, people are like, "Wow, yeah." I just make fun of like COVID sometimes, and and my some of my clients, my swimming clients, I'm like, <laughs> "What?" <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! If you give laughter is my favorite drug, and I really think yeah. it's healing. I think. Maybe Too Close for Comfort was a really dorky, dorky show at the time, but we made people laugh, I hope. Yeah. yeah. And also, I found out that if you are, if you're a caregiver or you're around someone who's sick, mm -hmm. just by being loving, that's half the battle. People who are ill or feel neglected, if you just tell them you love them and you, you send them flowers or you send them hearts, that's half of the healing power right there. It's the attentive, loving nurses that heal. Absolutely. But um, I don't know. I, it, to me, it's I'm always falling up. That's the title of my recovery book, Falling Up. The other book, the humor book, is Hiding My Brain in My Bra, which I'm still. <laughs> 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 and yeah. I just I'm so ambitious, ruthlessly ambitious. I wanted really I wanted to be the great Pulitzer Prize winning writer. And I wanted everyone to think I wrote the great American novel. And I remember I was writing. <laughs> A book on Stalin's plot to kill Trotsky to show off how, how brilliant I was. It was like ego. Oh, no, it's all ego based. I know. I know. We all, all of us do that. Yeah, we all do that. Yeah, we all do it. Um, <laughs> so silly. Some money miracles um, through surrender. In the beginning of my surrender process, the five years when I was on a pink cloud in recovery, um, I was so open to the universe showing me your magic. I kept saying, what's next? I didn't yeah. ever look at the negative. I'm telling you, if you start thinking negative thoughts, yes, your your experience of life will be very negative. I it's agree, hundred percent. You create your own reality. You really do. Totally. Your but, your words and your thoughts and your words are so powerful. But think about this. It's hard. You can say that to people, and they go, "Yeah, but it's, it doesn't make sense. It's easier said than done." But if you think about what you see all day in your viewfinder, mm -hmm. if you're Pollyanna and you're looking at the beauty. The beauty is going to be all you see. It makes sense. It's logical. Yeah. But we tend, our, our human mortal mind tends to want to go toward a hunter gatherer instinct. What's dangerous? We got to be in fear. We got to like protect ourselves. What I need more for me. And, and that, 
it's really interesting because I don't think you can solve this yourself. That's why I think you need to believe in something greater, that the power of love is there to hold you up. Great. So I was out of money. I mean, I was out of money. The IRS was coming after me for a huge debt. Wow. It wasn't wow. that. It was $11,000. And they said, we, and I kept saying, can I have a payment plan? They wouldn't do it. it was, my kid was. They wouldn't do a payment plan? What? This is a certain time in my in my life. I'd had too many payment plans and I wanted this money. And I was like, oh, they're going to take 11000 out of my IRA. Uh, so I got on my knees and I said, well, if it works for everything else, it worked for alcoholism. It worked for meeting my husband. Literally, I surrendered it. Right. And I said, I can't solve this by myself. And I remember the day I prayed, I just said, if there's a God and I don't, ever believe in religion. So this is not a religious no, this is, Religion is based on fear. You're, what you're saying is based on love. So it's two different things. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I said, I surrender this money problem. Show me the way. Show me what I need to do. I didn't worry. The rest, it was really weird. I didn't worry. The very next day, this is going to sound crazy. I got a letter from the state of California saying there are $12,000 in a bank account of yours from 1986. What? That it's been collecting interest. To prove to get your money, yeah. prove, your prove that your name is Natasha Kornilov, and my name's Lydia Kornilov. It's the Russian name, but I chose Natasha as my fake middle name for years. Right now, I couldn't prove I was named Natasha Kornilov, and then I realized I put the name Natasha on my child's legal birth certificate for some bizarre reason. I put Lydia Natasha Kornilov Cornell. Wow. And I sent them a copy of the birth certificate, my passport, and they sent me $12,000. And I'm like, wow, what a sweet little, That's little situation. Yeah. At the time, you know. Other Definitely. things, a lot of those things happen all the time. Like when oh. you surrender, when, when it's like when you're worried and planning, then I find that that doesn't work. But when I surrender and I'm like, okay, you know. The, this is what I would love to happen, but whatever is your plan, God, I'm cool with it. Just it like that. It's like prayers are answered like that. I never do. I never, when I'm doing my own, my own ego centered bullshit, excuse my language. Um, <laughs> we have to do this, don't worry. <laughs> All right. I, yeah, it took me for years to, to start using the F word. I forbade my kids to use the F word. And then I went to stage in comedy clubs going, I want to use the F word now. And this one club said, no, we can't use it in this one. What club like, says you can't use the F word? Club says it's mandatory. <laughs> what? That club that I'm the founder of with LG Ross, that comedy, serving up comedy. Oh, that one. Yes, you have to be clean. I've done that show. Oh, my God. I know it's so hard. I'm looking forward to using the F word. I'm like, yeah, wait, I get up on stage and they go, no. Oh my God. So here, here, look, we have some people, everybody's like, they love you. Of course. Surprise. I love you all. I love everyone. I have this like universal love for humanity today. And I was like crying. No, I know we have to have that. Yes. And compassion. So here he's saying, Mike is saying so many gifts come from surrender. Do you believe that? Oh gosh, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Surrender meaning you have when you're at your wit's end and there's no other way to go, and you, you flow like water. If there's a wall, mm -hmm. water flows over it, under and through the cracks. You just flow. Go with the flow. Go, go with the Don't flow. Mom always used to say that. Yeah, just go with the flow. Wherever I had a, an issue, I was like, "What should I do? What should I do?" She's like, "Graciela, just go with the flow. Go, go with the flow. Thank you." I'm like, "Okay." Exactly, <laughs> mom. But uh, oh, I forgot to tell you a really cool yeah. dog. Go ahead. Is another question? Go ahead. Um, <laughs> is there another question? You're like, come on, go ahead. Let's get the questions. Uh, no, I'm gonna say. Um, oh, the way I do metaphysics. Yes. Is that I love this quote by Einstein: "No problem can be solved at the same level it was created on." Ooh. You have so you. You can't cure alcoholism with more alcohol and drugs. You can't cure fight fire with fire. Right. You can't solve war with bombs. I love it. You can't really achieve peace that way. You have to go to a spiritual or a diplomatic solution. And the spiritual solution, people are so afraid of God and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm always reticent to use the word God because people have had a fear and punishing relationship with God or they've had a terrible religious upbringing. 
But right. when I found out that it's this wonderful relief from all my burdens that I can actually right. cast burdens on the, in the Bible, it says, cast your burdens on the Lord. Okay. I can put yes. all in God's lap. I never have been happier in my life than when I turn my thoughts immediately over to Meh, what's next. Yeah. yeah. You don't worry. Yeah. It, it's true. Whenever we try so hard to plan and to solve problems, it's just, it never works. At least I, I, my experience has always been that way. Uh, yeah. So tell me, what were the highlights um, of your road to recovery? Like well, highlights well, you can think of. The God shots. And then I got married oh, and yeah. I fell down to earth a little because I'm married. Oh, yeah, you got married. Okay, we know that story. We know how that story goes. Uh, so <laughs> My husband left me for Gene Simmons. He went on the road with Kiss and he bit. Anyway, um, I've written so much comedy about my marriage, and it's turned out to be the biggest gift. And then in everything that's bad in life, something good remains. Only the good remains. Only the good is yeah. real. Now, if you don't believe that, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Try thinking of life as all good all the time. Because if you think of duality, bad versus good, you never win. It's always fighting each other. Just think everything's good. Go to the higher plane of thought mm -hmm. and seek the highest thought. And I remember when my husband left me, uh, he went out, He wanted to end the marriage, and I found out he had a girlfriend somewhere. I know this is – I still love him. We're very good friends. He makes me laugh hysterically. But we got married to heal the ancient wounds of our childhoods, our respective right. childhoods. That's one of those relationships, yeah. yeah. He had the same kind of parenting thing I had. And we were, we did it while we were together. We raised two little boys together, his son, my son. And it was a great marriage. So I look back, I go, wow, everything was really perfect. It was a horrible, if you look at the outside, we had, you know, a lot of craziness going on. But, but now I feel like it was all a gift. Everything, everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. Right. You know, it's really, you, the past... By the way, when you have an accident and you say you have a broken leg or I have friends who have back pain and they go, it's my sciatica. I had an accident 20 years ago and I'll never recover. Marrying yourself to that thought of the accident keeps the, the wound stuck in your body. Absolutely. Forget that. Walk away from that belief. I love that. You know, the past. Move forward. Is yeah. The past is the past. Learn from it and move on. Right? Yeah. Pretty much. Um, so here, let's see, we have like something that's not related to recovery. We have a question from Dave. Hi, Dave. Uh, Lydia, I keep hearing that on the set of Caddyshack that every day was a party. Some of the aspects of that, including the excessive drinking and the drug use at night was not a fan of. Did Ted ever share this with you? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. He sort of came to work the first days. Our pilot was picked up after we filmed it in, in the spring and then we come back to work after I went to Greece to do a movie in the summer and then we're back to work. It was a right. It was an actor strike. That's right. So we were back to work in September or November. Um, Ted was raging about the set. He said, those people, those drug addicts, and those debauchery. <laughs> so it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, but he would, he would, whenever he would be mad, he would burst out laughing in a cackle right after the debauchery. And they go, <laughs> You have to see, I mean, Ted was so fun to be with. He he really liked Chevy Chase, whereas I don't hear a lot of people have a great experience. Of, of really? Murray. But Rodney, see, Ted came back from the set and he would go, whenever there was anyone late coming to the camera, yeah. they, I was in my dressing room and they would say, Lydia, he would go, while we're young. And Rodney Dangerfield on Caddyshack said, while we're young. Well, we're young. I know I'm, I'm performing shtick right now. Ronnie, <laughs> it's going to right over my head. But <laughs> um, in, the, in the movie Caddyshack, Roddy Dangerfield would keep going, well, we're young about the golf caddies. Oh, and okay. Golf them. So Ted adopted Rodney's same joke, but did his own intonation on it. So that's that's the only quest, the only memory I have. That's it. Okay. 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 Um, here we have Aaron Whitney. Hi, Aaron. The hardest day to stay sober is tomorrow. That is because you are unaware of what is waiting to sabotage your sobriety. So do you have any stories where your sobriety was sabotaged? You have to, first of all, you can't let an outside event, like the storm, the crash of the stock market, any outside event can't ruffle your inner inside, your inner peace. 
once you have the real kind of sobriety I'm talking about, and, and it's a daily reprieve, our spiritual, our sobriety is based on a maintenance of our spiritual condition, mm -hmm. which means our ability to trust the higher power, which is loving. And I don't, I've had, um, God, I'm sad. I have a thousand crazy drug and drunk stories. My drunkalogue is hilarious, and it's got some. I went to an audition once for a famous producer who he loved my work, and he was this. He won an Oscar later for a movie, and he said, "Lydia, I want you to come read for the lead in the pilot." And I went, "Okay." So I fill an entire Evian bottle up with vodka, and I put oh it. My in the God. And I'm so blitzed by the time I get to the studio. I have perfume to spray away the smell mm -hmm. of vodka. And I put the gym bag in the ladies' room at the network, the big uh -huh. network, in the executive ladies' room. I stick, stush the, the gym bag underneath the sink. And I go running in and out of there to swig until they call my name. I enter the room, and there's seven men, producers, executives, and the, the director all there. And I was wearing stiletto high heels and skin tight jeans. And I literally tripped into the room. And the button on my jeans popped off, and I flipped over onto the couch. <laughs> and I got back up, and I went up, oh. and I sort of just had to read the lines, and I couldn't get them out. Oh no! I was a radioactive. It was horrifying. That was like the worst. Oh my god! In years I lived with that guilt until I got sober. It was like that wasn't even the worst thing. And then one time I was starring in a play. And I had gone out with Don Simpson, who produced Top Gun, all those shows. And I went to his house the night before, and we ended up doing cocaine all night. And I didn't show up for my own play. Oh, my God. It caused the director to quit show business altogether. <laughs> oh, my God. Damn. It's not funny. It's like. No, but, I know, but damn. But you would never think you could overcome these kind of horrors. Yeah. Some way worse things until you get sober. And then you realize, wow, everything added up. The domino effect to what I am now, and if I hadn't hadn't had that particular sobriety, I wouldn't have this child. You know, if one domino hadn't been in place, I wouldn't have Jack. This amazing life, which is all an inside job. Absolutely. So yeah. I think, yeah, no, nothing's ever tempted my sobriety. Oddly enough, I've never. It's so weird. I have never felt tempted to drink. I mean, I don't even think. I just. I couldn't imagine doing that to my sponsees and the people who you're trying to help. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. although you, it's, it's quite common. In fact, I shouldn't say that. Yeah. I should knock on wood because it could happen tonight. In fact, yeah. it's a daily reprieve. And so I better, you know, I better not be cocky about that. Well, so far you can say that you haven't had a desire to drink or do anything, right? But I have a desire to screw up my life. It's not like, you know, you're you, right. You know, I don't treat, choose that as my drug of choice anymore, alcohol and drugs. They, I know they don't work. I know they kill my brain right. cells. I know it eats your brain alive. I have a friend who did meth and his gums are gone, his teeth are gone, his brain is fried. Um, alcohol just poisons the liver. and it. My stepsister died of full-blown alcoholism at 49 years old. Oh, my God. An AWOL off from the Navy with a brilliant girl and drank herself to death. And I, my brother, I didn't tell this story, and I need to tell it. Go ahead. Yes, please. My baby brother, whom I yelled at in the recovery, in the intervention, I said, look at him. He's a pothead. Yeah, that one. My little brother, whom I love with all my heart and soul, uh, one year after, in December 1995, I found his body. And he had been, he tried heroin three times. He was a concert pianist, an incredibly beautiful soul, gorgeous guy, very fragile. And he was dead. I found his body. He and it was like it wasn't, I was sober, and I didn't think I could stay sober through that, or 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 my future wedding where you have to drink champagne and all these things. But I remember I called his girlfriend. He had a girlfriend for ten years that he loved madly. They had been going through some hard breakup stuff. She was a vice president at Neiman Marcus in Dallas. I called her and I said, "Vicky, Paul died." She sobbed hysterically. I'm coming to the funeral. She gets in the car. Drives through Denver in a snowstorm, drinking, and kills an entire family and herself in a head-on collision. An eight-year-old little boy in the other car. Oh my God, I'm so and sorry. alcoholism kills. Alcohol kills. Alcohol, yes. you can't fucking drink and drive. No. And you can't 
solve this with human means. There's no pill for it. It's a genetic predisposition mixed with a, an allergy and a, and, a, and a lot of us have very, very low self-esteem in the beginning. I mean, you overcome that through the program. The steps are very, this is the easier way. I couldn't imagine trying to moderate my drinking. And then- Of course, of course, dude, you can't, right? It's Knowing that it killed brain cells is enough for me right now. I want all my brain cells. Right, 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 right. right. You know, it's like, I don't know if it's the same, but I, I had a narcissistic ex that approached me a few days ago and I had to call a friend of mine and I was like, you know, I really want to connect with him, but I know the consequences are going to be terrible because I've been through this before. And so she said something so beautiful. She said, okay, whenever you want to call him, just think, do I love myself or do I want to call him? Oh, wow. I was like, that just was so genius oh, that him. every time I thought about calling him, I, I had, okay, no, I love myself more than That's beautiful. not love myself, which would be oh. calling him. Oh, I love that. So that's one, one thing, you know, that I don't know if it works, you know, if you're an alcoholic, but that it worked for me, which being with a narcissist, it's kind of like an addiction. If you grew up with a narcissistic parent. So you were you were healing those wounds in yourself by avoiding right. him. In other words, that's healed now in you, I hope, I think. Yeah. No, I think it is. Yeah. I don't want to go through that drama. Thank you very much. Passing on that. Yeah. I have some people in my life that I'm I'm bewildered by to the point where for the past three years I've been gaslighted by a really close family member. I it's so bizarre that I thought I was going insane. I really I went, how could that's, you know? that's the whole yeah, that's the whole point of them gaslighting you it, because it, they put it on you. So you're like, am I going crazy? No. Mm -mm. And I still quite, I still get riled up a little inside. They go, wait a minute. Forgive her? Love her. Forgive. And this happened when my, I found out my ex-husband, um, we'd been divorced for quite a few years and he's, oh gosh, he was a bit of a con artist and stuff, but I still love him. He was fun and he was a great dad to a great stepdad. And we, we traveled the world together, had a lot of fun. Then I find out he's getting married. I saw it on Facebook and I went, oh, and it hurt me like a knife in my heart. This was in 2015. And I just felt like a knife in my heart, like a burning ache. Yeah. And I got in my car when I need a meeting. What's the highest thought? Give me the highest thought. That's what I said. The minute I said that, I heard this, forgive him, Ooh. forgive him, pray for her, forgive him, pray for her, his wife. I called up his friend and he said, she's dying of cancer. And I got him, I just started sobbing for the woman he's gonna marry. And that's not human, that's not human power. I was not normally inclined to love the woman marrying him, but I prayed for her and I just, I realized that that's the highest thought giving me, that's God's thought telling me to calm down and not be jealous, you know. Absolutely, and I think, you know, fear and anger are low vibration feelings or whatever, yeah. feelings, whatever they are, and love, joy and peace are higher. So. I think another yeah. thing is like whenever we want to go to anger and fear, which we're very used to and they're very addictive, then just think, okay, do I want to like relish? And it's like mud wrestling, you know, if you're like there and <laughs> do I really want to get myself dirty or like fly and, and, and like be feel light and happy. So if you want to fly and feel light and happy, go to the higher vibration feeling. So that's what you do. And I love that. You do yeah. that all the time. I know. That yeah, it's hard to practice. By the way, all this stuff, just, yeah. <laughs> and I keep forgetting. Oh my god, I heard today from my uh, friend who said, "Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself." Because I'm always beating myself up for not finishing my book, and it's like I want the book to give me everything I already have right now. I have everything I want. I'm just going to be grateful, and it's really interesting. I never knew this until during my divorce. There was a moment where I went outside the house. We had this big house on the corner where all the kids used to come over. You know, both sets of kids had all their friends over every day. And then suddenly everyone was gone. My husband was leaving the marriage with his kid. They were going to the Kiss Tour in Europe for the summer. My son was going with his dad for the summer. And I'm left alone in this huge, big haunted house. It felt haunted. Wow. And I went into my little boy's, my stepson's room. I'm not going to be living with him anymore after this, you know? Mm. He's 13, 14. I go in his room and there's the fingerprints we put on the wall of his little hands dipped in paint, all the little things he wrote. And I just had to close the door. 
And I went outside and I started grieving on the front lawn. And I sat there and I looked up and I was sitting under a fig tree. And I go, I never knew we had a fig tree in this yard. That's how unconscious I was in the marriage. The whole time I'm like, Pokemon parties, Yu-Gi-Oh parties. Everything was for everybody but me. Yeah. I remember being a very big, um, I wanted that white picket fence marriage to last forever. And I looked up and I saw the fig tree, it had no fruit on it. And I realized I've never seen fruit on this tree. Well, cut to a year later after I'd come through all this spiritual stuff, my yeah. second level of recovery, it wasn't drinking, but I was, I didn't drink through any of this stuff, but I was still growing. At the end of that year, the whole tree was full of figs. It's like my life had come to fruition. And the path as a writer was starting to bloom. And I remember that phrase, bloom where you're planted. And then as I'm sitting there grieving, this butterfly comes around my head and I'm like, I never liked butterflies. I never knew butterflies were so beautiful. Yeah. I became obsessed with butterflies. There was a whole nature experience that summer. And the, the words that came to me are, the universe is interactive. It wants to play with us, but yeah. we're never present enough to, we're never present enough to appreciate what's right in front of us. Yeah. So we can't enjoy the gifts. And so the, it's going to give you whatever you want, but I don't, I'm in regret or fear, worry, or, or whining about the past or worrying about the future. I'm not here now. And I started to be in the present and all these gifts started coming like I amazing know. things. When we're in the present, we're paying attention, like you're saying, you know, and that's so important to pay attention because you can be having signs of things, you know, and you're like totally missing the point. And then that's mm -hmm. when we mess up. So um, we've been talking for like 45 minutes. Oh, my God. I, I can go. No, we almost like, yeah, 45. I, we can go on and on and on. But you know what? I want you to come back and mm -hmm. talk some more. So let's leave them wanting more of Lydia. <laughs> Which I know they will. You're the food. Um, I love you all. Stay wow. safe. Stay safe. Yeah, you guys stay safe. And thank you so much for all the beautiful comments and for staying on and listening to the wonderful Lydia and her inspirational stories and Thank her you. amazing journey. I love you. I love and you. You. I love you so much. You're amazing. You're an angel. And you yeah. practice what you preach. You do too, by the way. Thank you. Sure. I, mean, I want to interview you. Now I have to interview you for God Shots. I haven't started that yet. but Oh, my gosh. Well, we need to do that's our <laughs> next episode. This is like the second time. There's a third time for sure. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you next. In two weeks, I'm not going to have a, a stream next weekend. I'm taking off. Uh, going out of town. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you guys soon.